Hi, I'm Derek, and this is DC to Daylight, where we explore the world of electronics in the realm of DC, audio frequencies, RF, and into the visible spectrum of light. One of the simplest starter circuits when learning electronics is how to safely light up an LED. I say safely because it doesn't take all that much current to damage one. I know you've probably used an LED and resistor combo before, but we're going to cover a few things that you don't run across in a textbook. So in this episode, we'll take a look at several different methods of illuminating an LED using a current limit resistor for a single LED, as well as multiple LEDs in parallel and series, including the right way and the wrong way to do it. We'll also look at using a transistor current source to power up a string of LEDs in series. And don't forget to come back in a couple of weeks because we're going to put current driven LEDs into an exciting project. Also, don't be shy. If you want to get in touch with me and talk about some of these topics, I would love to hear from you down in the comments in the Element 14 community down in the link below and let me know what projects you would like to see. Let's get started. LEDs are a special type of semiconductor diode, whereby as current flows through the device under forward bias conditions, they emit photons of a particular wavelength or color. To quickly recap, a diode is a semiconductor device with two doped sections of silicon, one with an excess of electrons, the n-type, while the other has a deficiency of electrons, or p-type. If we apply enough potential voltage across this device, overcoming the barrier potential, free electrons from the n-type material will cross over the depletion region and recombine with holes in the p-type material. When this occurs, some energy is dissipated as heat. In the case of LEDs, the semiconductor materials are made from gallium arsenide, gallium phosphide for reds and yellows, while blues utilize indium gallium nitride. Whatever fancy name we give to them, something interesting happens when free electrons from the N material cross over the barrier potential and recombine with holes in the P material. Instead of only dissipating heat, they will also release a photon of a particular wavelength. So let's connect an LED to our little curve tracer here. And we'll take a look at the voltage current or VI curve on our oscilloscope. So just like the standard uh, small signal diode we see, here's the origin and instead of conducting at 1 volt, the LED conducts, in this case a red LED, at uh, around 1.8 volts. And then as that uh, voltage increases we start to see uh, conduction here. So this is uh, the current increasing through the LED. Uh, however, where the LED conducts depends on how the LED was manufactured, so you've got to check your data sheet for a parameter called VF. Uh, this is our forward voltage where that conduction occurs. This curve tracer jig has a built-in current limiting resistor. It might be a little difficult to see here. If we don't put a current limit resistor in series with the LED, it'll try to pass a large amount of current and the LED will be damaged. Even if you use a low voltage, eventually the LED will fail. All right, so here's a typical LED data sheet. Uh, company is Cree. This is for a red LED. Um, I'm just going to click off here and you'll I'll disappear. Uh, but there are some parameters that we want to take a look at that are of importance to us. The first one is the forward current. OK, so the absolute maximum rating uh, for continuous duty is 50 milliamps. And there's a note one here that says we should, uh, for long term performance, drive it between 10 and 30 milliamps. And typically, you know, 10 to 20 is where you kind of, if you don't know, that's kind of a safe ballpark to operate in. Uh, peak forward current is 200 milliamps, but notice that that is for a pulse width of 100 microseconds or less at a duty cycle of one tenth. Okay, um, so we want to kind of stay in that range. That's super important. Now the forward voltage of the LED for this particular one with the drive current of 20 milliamps is 2.1. So the LED will consume 2.1 volts at this rated current, okay? And maximum is 2.6. So we'll take a look at a graph in a second and see uh, how the drive current versus the uh, forward voltage changes, okay? But those are the parameters that we're interested in when we design our circuit. So if we scroll down, we have a bunch of other LEDs, different part numbers, and then we have uh, this section here that shows the forward current, okay, along the y-axis and the forward voltage along the x-axis. So at 20 milliamps, you can see where they get that number of 2.1 volts from. And if we increase the drive current or current going through the LED, the forward voltage actually increases, okay? And if we have one LED out of a string of LEDs in series, um, one of them will consume more current and get hotter and this will actually change. So we want to ensure that we're forcing uh, the same current through all of the LEDs, you know, for this reason. 
In addition, we can see the intensity versus the forward current, and we can see the colors that are actually produced uh, for this particular LED. Yeah, so that's basically it. That's what we're looking for in the data sheet. So uh, let's go over to a little bit of theory. Now, how do we select a resistor to current limit our LED so that it sees 20 milliamps? Let's assume that the voltage supplied to our LED circuit is five volts. Maybe it's coming from a microcontroller pin. Our LED consumes two volts, as we saw from the forward voltage parameter of the data sheet. That means that the remaining voltage appears across the series current limiting resistor, so we're left with three volts across the resistor. To find the required resistor, which allows 20 milliamps of current to flow through the circuit, using Ohm's law, we say that resistance is equal to voltage divided by current. Substituting the voltage across the resistor, divided by our 20 milliamps we want, that is equal to 150 ohms. So this resistor needs to be 150 ohms with a 5 volt supply to provide 20 milliamps of current through the circuit. And it's that easy. So here's that same circuit. We have an LED. We have a resistor that's going to limit our current. Uh, positive's going to the anode. The resistor is connected to the cathode and that goes to ground. I don't have a 150 ohm value resistor in stock so we're using 180 here which is close enough. I can go up in value and my current decreases slightly. So let's plug it in and there you go. And you can see it's uh, ready to provide an estimated 50,000 hours worth of photons for our viewing pleasure, but we have better things to do. Okay, now a quick word about what not to do. Uh, I see this question quite a bit and can I run multiple LEDs in parallel from a single resistor? And there's a couple reasons you don't wanna do that. Number one, there's no way to ensure that the processing of these is the same even if they're built on the same silicon wafer in a process chamber. So the forward voltage will be different on pretty much all of these. So one of them will carry more current than the rest. And what's gonna happen is the voltage, uh, forward voltage will actually change and that guy will go into possibly thermal runaway and one could burn out. The other thing is we have a single resistor and if we have 20 milliamps going through each one of these LEDs, this guy has to pass all of that current and distribute it evenly. So 20 times four is 80. So now this guy has 80 milliamps. So just to get rid of all that, circumvent all those issues, just give each LED its own current limit resistor based on the supply voltage. So the other commonly asked question is, can I run a bunch of these LEDs in series with a single resistor? And you're gonna find that you run into the same kind of issues. One will carry more current, you know, and because the forward voltage could be different. We can't regulate the amount of power that that particular LED is dissipating. So what we need to do is force a certain amount of current regardless of the voltage. And we can do that by replacing this resistor, okay, with a current source, right? And we can do that with a simple NPN transistor. Bipolar transistors like the 2N3904, which we're gonna use in this demonstration, can be used as a current source if we forward bias the base emitter junction of the transistor and reverse bias the base collector junction of the transistor. And we do that by applying a more positive voltage at the base than the emitter, right? Greater than 0.70 volts. That's how we forward bias this internal diode. And we apply a more positive voltage on the collector than the base to reverse bias this junction of the transistor. Okay, the base collector. Now we need to bias this transistor in such a way that we can develop 20 milliamps flowing through this collector emitter junction. And we do that by setting up a voltage at the emitter resistor using Ohm's law to allow a certain amount of current to flow. So to get a certain voltage uh, across this resistor, we have to develop a certain voltage at the base that is 0.7 volts higher than the emitter. Let's go through these equations. I know it looks a little scary. So what I'm doing here, we're assuming that we're applying five volts uh, input from like an Arduino or some microcontroller, okay? And I'm using a voltage divider here with two equal resistor values to basically cut that in half. Now, the voltage at the base using the voltage divider formula is R2 divided by the sum of R1 plus R2 multiplied by your voltage in, all right? So we'll see that uh, we set up a ratio, 1K, which is this guy, divided by the sum of these two, which is 2K. So 1 half times the five volts is equal to 2.5. Now, because we have a 0.7 volt drop across this internal diode, it's 2.5 volts here, but we end up with 1.8 volts on this side because we've subtracted that 0.7 volts. Now we wanna solve for our emitter resistor that allows 20 milliamps to flow through our collector emitter junction. 
Okay, and that's pretty easy. Using Ohm's law, resistance is equal to voltage divided by current. So we take our base voltage and subtract our 0.7 volts and divide it by our design current that we want flowing through this leg. All right, so that becomes 2.5 minus 0.7, which is 1.8. Divide that by the 20 milliamps we want, and we end up with an emitter resistor value of 90 ohms. Now, 90 ohms isn't really a standard value, but 91 ohms is. I happen to have that in my resistor drawer. So we're gonna put this into our breadboard, all of this stuff, and we're gonna make this thing run. So now that we've talked about all of this, let's go over to the breadboard. So here's that very same circuit. We have our voltage divider here. We've got our five volt signal that simulates our uh, Arduino or whatever microcontroller is connected here. That goes directly to the base of the transistor. Our emitter goes to ground with a 91 ohm resistor and our collector side is driving four red LEDs. And we wanna make sure that we have uh, 20 milliamps flowing through this circuit, okay? So I have an ammeter which is in series with these LEDs and I can check the current. So let's turn this on. We'll apply five volts to our voltage divider. And there we go. They're all lit up with the same brightness. All right, and you can see we have about 19 milliamps flowing, okay? So that's at 12 volts. So in dealing with current sources, we need to be aware of what's called compliance voltage, okay? We need to make sure that whatever we're driving here, we have enough voltage supplied uh, to apply to all of these LEDs. So we're consuming two, four, six, eight volts approximately and some in the emitter resistor. If I'm only supplying eight volts, that's not enough to turn all of this stuff on. So we need to stay a few volts above that. Now, I just wanna show you what that looks like when I drop the voltage down and we fall out of compliance. So I'll be monitoring with an ammeter the current flowing through this leg of the circuit, and we'll use a voltmeter to measure the collector emitter voltage across the transistor. As the voltage across the transistor approaches zero, the transistor is going into saturation, and we can no longer supply enough voltage to this part of the circuit, and the whole thing essentially turns off. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, so I've got two test leads that are going across the collector emitter of my transistor, and I have my ammeter you can't really see the other probe, but uh, going from the LED to the positive rail. And you can see across the transistor uh, collector emitter junction, we have about three volts. And as we designed, we have about 20 milliamps going through the circuit. Now I'm gonna adjust the voltage on my power supply and I'm gonna drop down the supply voltage slowly. So we're at like 10 volts now. You can see my collector emitter voltage is dropping. I'm at nine volts eight volts and it's really starting to turn off now. Okay, so the transistor's turning off and my current is halved and we're essentially, you can see the LEDs dimming there. So we wanna make sure that we are several volts above the voltage that's being uh, consumed in that collector circuit and back up to 12 volts. So that's compliance voltage in a nutshell. Well, we've covered driving single LEDs with a current limit resistor, LEDs in parallel, and how to drive series LEDs with a current source. We can, of course, construct more complicated and stable LED drivers, but I leave that up for discussion within the Element 14 community, for which the link is down in the description. I'm always poking around in the comments and frequent the community daily, so don't be shy and post your comments and questions there. I'm also interested to hear in what you want to see covered in these videos. I personally am interested in fundamentals, applications, and the dark corners of electronics. But what do you want to see? Well, that's it for me. I'll see you next time and stay tuned for that cool project coming up. All right, have a good one.